Okay, um, I'm going to get us started then with uh, a quick introduction, and then um, I'll hand it over to you. You can share your screen, uh, and um, I think most of us just mute our cameras and microphones unless you want us to keep them on for visual interaction. <laughs> no, uh, I'll be watching my slides, but if you, um, we can, I mean, it's a small group, so we can just interrupt. I only have about 35 slides. I tend to talk a lot, as you already can tell, but um, so if you just want to interrupt, if something comes up, then we can be very informal. So unmute and just interrupt. It doesn't have to be like a formal thing. <clears throat> well, I'll still give you a, a somewhat formal introduction uh, <laughs> for the people who will watch this um, later. Uh, but it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Elizabeth Welberg. Um, Dr. Welberg comes to us from the Oklahoma University of Oklahoma Health Science Center, where she's a, an assistant professor. I think you've been there almost a year now. Is that I right? Just, yep, just a year. Yeah. Um, she earned her PhD and um, bachelor's of science at Texas A&M and uh, followed that up with postdoc at Texas A&M and then uh, the University of Colorado. Um, and like I mentioned, she's now at the Oklahoma Health Science Center and um, has recently uh, been awarded an, an R01 um, on her research that I think she's gonna talk about some of that today. Uh, so that's very exciting. I first met um, Dr. Wahlberg in Italy. At, no, it was before uh, that, it was in Rhode Island. I think Italy came first, actually. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah. Well, I have a picture in my uh, talk from Rhode Island. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and uh, that was at a, uh, a Gordon conference on mammary gland biology, uh, which was a lot of fun, um, and followed that up uh, again with a, another Gordon conference in Rhode Island. Uh, the year after that and so we've we've known each other for quite a while and i'm very excited to hear her talk today uh, on fgfr and er crosstalk as a driver of endocrine therapy resistance in obesity associated breast cancer so take it away okay thank you um i'm going to let me do the slideshow and then i'm going to make you all little so i can see my slides um, thanks, Brad. Uh, thanks for inviting me and for hosting me as maybe you heard me chattering earlier. You know, I'm, I'm not um, totally on board with everything being virtual these days, but this is our life. And actually this provides a really nice opportunity for me to visit friends and visit different institutions and talk about work. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about some of the work that so I just started my lab, as Brad said, uh, at the end of 20 or at the beginning of 2020. And that was a kind of a good time and a bad time to start my lab because I, you know, there was a lot going on in 2020, but also, you know, it was sort of a down year anyway for us. So what I'm going to talk about is some of the stuff that I did um, towards the end of my postdoc and when I was transitioning to my independent position um, that led to uh, the R01. Um, that we just got in 2019, but then, you know, has just transferred to Oklahoma. So what I work on is um, the relationship between obesity and breast cancer. And I sort of make this, I made this infographic kind of to illustrate the different projects that we have going on in the lab um, in order to communicate to students and other people at Oklahoma but it's nice for talks as well. So basically, um, <clears throat> both obesity and type two diabetes increase the risk for breast cancer. And I'm gonna talk about some of the clinical data behind that in a second. Um, this is really specific to the ER positive subtype, the estrogen dependent subtype. Um, and those types of cancers are treated with anti-estrogen or endocrine therapies. And what we're realizing now, uh, because the therapies are so successful is that women after breast cancer um, have an increased risk for being diagnosed with diabetes. 
Uh, so this is kind of a, a cyclical relationship and the, the risk for diabetes as a side effect of breast cancer treatment is a problem in itself. And this represents kind of one side of the research going on in my lab, but it also can increase the likelihood of cancer recurrence, which would be another really bad problem. So what I'm going to talk about today is kind of this stuff over here. Um, looking at the role of obesity and not overt diabetes because we're using mouse models, but insulin resistance and metabolic dysfunction in the risk for and recurrence of ER positive breast cancer. And the talk today is going to be focused on the crosstalk between FGFR and ER that may exist in this scenario. Um, but other things that we're looking at include insulin receptor crosstalk with the estrogen receptor. And I collaborate with um, Dr. Doug e, who's in Minnesota, um, to look at insulin in his mice. And then also other projects looking at estrogen versus its receptor in adipose tissue biology. OK, so we know that obesity is a prevalent disease. And I put something like this in the beginning of most of my talks. But it's important to understand that obesity is very difficult to treat and reverse, and it is a disease in itself. Um, <clears throat> so I think about 35% of women are considered to have obesity. And if you consider overweight in that description, which is classified as a BMI greater than 25, it's about 70% of adults in the US are considered overweight or obese. Um, the, the prevalence of obesity tends to be concentrated in the Deep South and some states in the Midwest, including my new state, not my former state. Um, and there are actually significant health disparities and ra racial and ethnic disparities associated with obesity, but that's not something I currently work on. So obesity increases the risk for uh, several different diseases, including cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, but it also increases the risk for cancer. And just last year, the NIH put out, or NCI actually put out this image here showing 13 cancer types that are considered obesity associated. And this is based on strong epidemiological data linking obesity to these different types of cancer. So what I focus on specifically is postmenopausal breast cancer. Um, and after menopause, well, actually breast cancer in general is diagnosed as clinically one of three main subtypes, either ER, PR positive, that's estrogen or progesterone receptor positive, HER2 positive, or triple negative. And the majority of these cases are ER positive, and that is the type that's promoted by obesity strongly. Interestingly, this occurs more significantly after menopause, but before menopause, triple negative breast cancer is strongly promoted by obesity. And this is a paradox that we're still trying to understand and it may involve inflammation and growth factor signaling. But what I focus on is really the ER positive subtype. And regardless of subtype, the prognosis of women with breast cancer is worsened in the context of obesity. <clears throat> and that's shown here. So women with obesity have, um, a greater likelihood of cancer specific mortality um, and survival with breast cancer. Oops. Okay, so one of the things that I get asked frequently when I'm giving presentations is, especially to non scientific audiences, is like, okay, well, I know people with obesity who haven't had cancer. I know people who are not obese who have had cancer. So is there something better that we can use to predict? breast cancer risk specifically than just simply obesity, which is defined based on BMI, and that's your weight compared to your height? And the answer is yes, um, I think so. Uh, two of the things that I'm going to talk about specifically today are metabolic health and weight gain. So metabolic health refers to how your body processes glucose and how it responds in terms of producing insulin and clearing insulin, how all of these organs interact to um, promote nutrient availability to tumors and uh, mitogens such as insulin and growth factors. And the other thing that is potentially a better predictor than just simply looking at BMI is whether or not the BMI is stable. So adult weight gain is actually a significant predict predictor for breast cancer risk in women. Um, adipose tissue distribution is as well, but I'm not going to talk about that today. This is this refers to where the adipose tissue is located, whether it's central or uh, gluteofemoral, sort of the apple versus the pear shape. Um, 
if you think about it and those things, the distribution of adipose tissue is, is a predictor as well. Okay, so if we look at adult weight gain, which is one of the drivers of obesity associated breast cancer, um, a couple of different studies have suggested that for every, like for in this study, for example, every 11 pounds or five kilograms of weight gained as an adult increases the risk for breast cancer by approximately 10%. And another study showed that um, they looked at adult weight gain by BMI category and found that the highest risk for breast cancer was seen in women who were normal or considered overweight as young adults and then transitioned into the obese category as older adults. And so I illustrated that here showing that over time, even though people might end up at the same BMI, the higher risk is seen in individuals that increase their BMI over time rather than those who stay stable, um, even if they have excess body mass uh, as young adults, which is really fascinating to me. So the other component of this is what we call metabolic disease. And this is kind of a, one of those vague terms that, especially if you work in the endocrinology field, people get upset if you use a vague term like this, but what I'm referring, and it's measured differently, but what I'm referring to is essentially insulin resistance or hepatic steatosis or glucose intolerance, basically pre-diabetes, not overt diabetes, but a, a metabolically unhealthy state um, is something that's associated independently with breast cancer risk from simply being overweight or obese. And so each of these three studies illustrates that showing that the highest risk for breast cancer is seen in individuals that are considered either overweight or obese and are considered metabolically unhealthy. So when I was a postdoc, we, I uh, worked um, on a, in a breast cancer lab looking at cancer tumor metabolism, but I also collaborated with people that were studying uh, obesity and postmenopausal breast cancer in a rat model. And we called ourselves the fat rat group. Um, it had some really great members of it, some people who have moved on, um, but remain close colleagues. And essentially the basis of this rat model kind of got me started developing my own research program. And it was based on this diet induced obesity model. Um, OROP stands for obesity resistant and obesity prone. And we use that term because we use a high fat diet and then because the rats are outbred, they naturally sort of split into this bell curve and we collect the top and bottom tertiles as obesity prone or obesity resistant. And those mature into obese or lean um, rats respectively. The, this is an MNU model of mammary carcinogenesis. So we dose the animals with the chemical carcinogen and we specifically choose the time point that's during puberty when the mammary epithelium is rapidly proliferating and this enriches for mammary tumors that develop um, from exposure to this carcinogen. So in this model, we perform overectomy surgery which models menopause. It's not a perfect model, but it is a really good and clean way to remove ovarian hormone production. And then we've done a lot of different studies in this model, including um, focusing on energy balance, using whole body calorimetry and performing interventions. One of the things that we identified from this model was that there's a three week, three to four week period of rapid weight gain that occurs right after OVEX. And this we decided is analogous to kind of the menopausal transition and the energy imbalance that occurs during that time. Um, and we found that that was actually very meaningful for these cancer outcomes. So <clears throat> using calorimetry, we're able to separate animals based on not only their obesity status going into sort of the menopausal transition, but also on their energy balance that is occurring after menopause. And then, as I mentioned, we've performed interventions during this time point, anywhere from three weeks to up to 20 weeks after OVX, um, with the goal of preventing tumor progression, because these animals have tumors existing at the time of OVX, and also they'll develop new tumors, so we can look at risk as well. Um, so what I'm illustrating here is that, you know, the lean rats, everybody gains weight, you know, during their linear growth phase, and then they sort of plateau. The obese rats are heavier than the lean, or the obesity prone are heavier than the lean, but both groups of animals, this is looking at the four-week period following OVX, both groups of animals gain weight following OVX. And when we measure their energy balance using whole body indirect calorimetry, in Colorado we did this, 
during this three to four week period, some animals overeat just a little bit. So this is a low energy excess and some animals overeat a lot. So this is a high energy excess. And this occurs regardless of whether the animal is lean or obese. So if you think about obesity as a risk factor, and also you think about weight gain and metabolic dysfunction as risk factors, this model provided a very nice way for us to look at those things a little bit separately. And we found that Okay, so it's, um, we can match the animals for their energy balance during menopause. So we found that um, following long-term following OVEX, as is seen in um, epidemiological studies, the obese females had fewer tumors that regressed. So they had few tumors that fewer tumors that shrunk compared to lean. They had more tumors that progressed and they developed more new tumors. And one of the cool things we found from our study was that if we did tracers, which we could do with um, labeled glucose and fat, in the lean animals, so my cursor disappeared, in the lean animals experiencing a high energy balance, so that high positive energy balance group, it was their mammary gland or their, and, and this is gonna confuse the mammary biologist audience members. I learned that mammary gland to me means the mammary epithelium, but to endocrinologists means the subcutaneous adipose tissue. So that's what I'm referring to here is sub-Q adipose um, takes up more of the dietary nutrients uh, compared to the obese. But in the obese animals, it's the tumor that takes up the nutrients compared to the lean. And this same, uh, this same pattern of peripheral tissues taking up nutrients in the lean versus the obese was seen in the liver and in the muscle as well in this study. So we came up with, as I was finishing my postdoc, we came up with this kind of dual hit hypothesis, which was built off the clinical, clinical literature and our rat model and suggested that the two things that were very important for breast cancer progression were the metabolic impairment that was associated with obesity. So the underlying metabolic dysfunction combined with this positive energy balance or overfeeding. Um, and, and that argued that you could target either one, which is something that we've gone on to do. And I'm not going to talk about today, but we asked basically, how do these things work together to promote breast cancer? And then I asked, why isn't there a mouse model that we can use? The rat model is fantastic. It produces ER positive tumors, but it's very cumbersome and requires a lot of people to do these rat studies that take like a year each time. So um, as I was transitioning from my postdoc to my kind of non-tenure track faculty position, I started to develop this mouse model. And I was working based on these gaps in my ability to study breast cancer. And that was a mouse model of female obesity, weight gain that we could really zero in on the weight gain period, insulin resistance, which is a huge component of of our preclinical system and in the clinical literature, and also ER positive breast cancer. And so one thing that's important to think about with mice is that most transgenic mouse models don't produce ER positive tumors that sustain ER through for the duration of the disease progression. Some of them have ER a little bit early, but it's not they're not necessarily estrogen dependent tumors. While they may be luminal breast tumors, they're not ER positive in the sense that human tumors are. And so we, I wanted to develop a model to help us understand the mechanisms of how all of these things work together and also to allow us to test interventions um, that could hopefully be translated to the clinic one day. So I've developed this, I call it the DIOX model, diet-induced obesity xenograft. And I had to do a, little, a couple tricks because to use a xenograft model, which was required to do ER positive breast cancer research, um, we had to use immune compromised mice and immune compromised females are a little bit resistant to diet induced obesity. obesity. So we um, basically took some, some advice from the obesity field, the sort of obesity and diabetes community, and we use thermo neutrality to promote obesity in our mice. This is not my paper. But it's a paper that came out a few years ago that talks about the concept of warming the mouse to model human diseases. So we did that, and the, this is based on the idea that standard housing temperatures for mice in a standard vivarium are too cold for the animals, and they're under chronic cold stress, um, and they burn a lot of their excess calories for warmth instead of storing them for fat. So we were able to warm our cages such that they 
they ended up right here in the middle of this thermoneutral zone for mice, which ranges from like 28 to 33 Celsius. Um, and here you're looking at, so this is high fat, high sucrose diet compared to low fat, low sucrose. And the high fat is actually 40% fat. It's not like really high fat. Um, and the mice are on, when we put the mice on their diets, we didn't notice a huge increase in body mass until we started warming them right here shown by the arrow. And the body composition um, on the left, this graph is lean body mass and on the right is fat mass body fat percent. Lean body mass was influenced by diet, but not by warming before and after warming, but fat mass was. So the high fat fed females increase their fat mass after warming. Um, this is the standard. These are just some images of some of my, my, my girls. Um, this is our standard tumor study. And so we mature the females on their diet at thermoneutrality. And then when they're mature, we OVEX them and supplement them with estrogen and implant them immediately with ER positive human tumors. And we, do, we perform the OVEX and estrogen supplementation right away at the same time because of the stuff that I talked about with the RAP model, where we really want to zero in on this three to four week period following estrogen withdrawal or OVEX as a metabolic transition in these females. So once tumors establish, we randomize them based on their body fat percentage to either stay on estrogen or receive estrogen withdrawal, um, rather than giving them an aromatase inhibitor because we went to great lengths actually, somewhat controversially to demonstrate that the mice don't seem to produce adipose derived estradiol the way that humans do. Women, female breast tissue, human women breast tissue produces estrogen in postmenopausal environments, but mice do not do that. So we remove supplemental estrogen as a model of breast cancer therapy. And then we zero in on this three week window and collect tissues. And so when you look at different morphometric uh, parameters before and after estrogen withdrawal or in E2 treated and E withdrawal treated mice, estrogen withdrawal increases body weight in the high fat fed, increases body fat percent, increases HOMA IR and impairs glucose tolerance. So these are all things that are important to us, um, you know, based on what I talked about at the beginning. So what we found was the first study that we did was we found, we put in two different kinds of tumors. One was MCF7s, which are standard ER positive breast cancer cells that a lot of people use. And the other one was a new PDX tumor that was developed at the University of Colorado, UCD12. And we found that generally the MCF7s did not keep growing after estrogen withdrawal, even in the high fat fed females or the obese females, but the UCD12 tumors did. So this was interesting, this is a variability in how ER positive tumors responded to diet induced obesity. So we went to human data sets to try to understand what could be, um, what, what would a relationship be between obesity and endocrine resistance, which is what we were trying to model. So we pulled uh, gene expression data sets from patients that, tumors from patients that had been treated with arom aromatase inhibitors that were classified as either responders or non-responders to that therapy. And we cross-referenced that with primary tumors from patients with an elevated BMI. And what we did was look at the upstream regulators. So the pathways that were, that were predicted to be activated in these tumors based on their gene expression profile. And we tried to find out what was common between those that did not respond to endocrine therapy and those with an elevated BMI. And there were only five pathways that came up, came up from our analysis. One of them was FGFR1. Uh, signaling. Um, so we asked, is FGFR1 important for this obesity associated tumor progression? And incidentally, the MCF7 tumors that did not progress after estrogen withdrawal do not overexpress FGFR1. And FGFR1 amplification is something that's common in luminal breast cancer, in ER positive breast cancer. It's actually 10 to 15% of tumors I've read. Um, have FGFR1 amplification, and it does play a role in some cases in endocrine therapy resistance. Interestingly, the UCD12 tumors that did respond to the high fat environment do overexpress FGFR1. And this is shown here uh, by Western blot. Here's the UCD12 tumors. These are some controls, and those are the MCF7s. MCF7s have FGFR1, it's just not overexpressed. So when we went back to our endocrine uh, or our estrogen withdrawal model and we treated with an FGFR inhibitor, we found that um, as we saw the first time we did the study, the control tumors, which would be these right here, 
grew in the presence of obesity, even after we withdrew estrogen. But if we blocked FGFR1, that sensitized these tumors to estrogen withdrawal. So that suggested that it was important for this tumor progression. Since I did that study and we published it a couple years ago, we've done a couple um, additional studies with two different PDXs. One of them, UCD65, is an ER positive tumor that also overexpresses FGFR1. And it shows the same phenotype where it grows larger in the context of the high fat diet. This tumor is UCD18. It is, oh, this is wrong actually. It's ER negative and it's not, and it is FGFR1 overexpressing. Ah, that's a mistake. Um, but it doesn't show a difference with obesity. So this suggested that there is um, some interaction between ER and FGFR1 that may be important for this phenotype. And the further, the figures that I'm going to show you moving forward are from that UCD12 tumor from the previous slide. We haven't done a bunch of analysis yet on these two tumors. Okay, so one of the things we did early on was we, to try to validate the FGFR1 story was we just did one of those phospho-receptor tyrosine kinase screens. So this, this uh, shows you which proteins may be phosphorylated, which would indicate that they may be activated. So this screen indicated that FGFR1 was phosphorylated in the high fat fed tumors compared to the low fat. But like, for example, FGFR2A did not pop up as one that was different. Um, so it seemed pretty specific. We performed immunohistochemistry on the tumors and found that the phospho levels of FGFR1 were higher in the obese or high fat females compared to low fat, but total levels were not different. So this told us that the obese environment wasn't necessarily selecting for a clone of these tumor cells that had an amplified receptor, but it may be actually activating the receptor uniquely, um, and particularly if it was overexpressed. So uh, in, human, in human tumor samples, we looked at a, a tumor um, archive tumor set from patients treated with tamoxifen and identified that high levels of FGFR1 phosphorylation predicted a poor disease-free and breast cancer specific survival. And then in a separate data set from, Col these are both data sets from Colorado or, or uh, sample sets from Colorado, we found that um, tumors from patients with an elevated BMI had higher levels of phospho FGFR1, but not total. So this was consistent with some of the stuff that we were seeing in mice. So because of the difference in phospho, but not total, we started to look at the ligand because it, like I said, it suggested that the receptor may be activated. And we screened the adipose tissue and the tumors for lots of different things. But basically we came down to FGF1. So FGF1 is a, is a ligand for FGFR1 and it's produced by adipose tissue among other things. And we looked and found that it was significantly increased after estrogen withdrawal only in the high fat fed females. And this happened to correspond to changes in body weight. So the low fat fed females, the lean females didn't really gain weight after estrogen withdrawal, but the high fat fed females did. And we looked at adipose um, adipocyte size distribution. This is the subcutaneous adipose or the, breath, the mammary adipose and found that the largest adipocytes were seen in the high fat uh, fed e withdrawal females and FGF1 expression correlated with the fat mass of the mammary gland, the rate of weight gain after estrogen withdrawal and with the adipocyte diameter. And so <laughs> I, uh, part of my R01 was actually to look at how the adipose tissue decides to produce FGF1 because it wasn't simply obesity and it wasn't simply weight gain. There was a lot to the story. And I put, and I, the R01 was funded in 2019 and in 2020, this amazing paper came out that basically kind of scooped in one of my R01 and showed that um, adipocytes produce FGF1 in the presence when they get really big, essentially. It's a size uh, driven phenotype. So um, FGF1 is the top gene that was induced by in adipocytes by stimulation with this, this Yoda, which activates piezo one um, which is a channel that is activated by um, tension. And when the cell gets really big, essentially the channel opens and then growth factors can come out of this channel from large adipocytes. And they essentially stimulate, that's what's shown here in this figure, it's a complex figure, but they stimulate the expansion of the progenitor compartment to allow new adipocytes to form. So when you knock out 
piezo one, or basically when you when you don't produce FGF one, you end up with these hypertrophic adipocytes that can't stimulate new cell formation. So beautiful paper, um, and really provides a nice link between the concept of weight gain and obesity and impaired adipose tissue expansion and FGF1, which I think is important for breast cancer progression in this environment. So this was our working model. Um, and it essentially shows that, you know, the adipose tissue of lean and obese females responds differently to estrogen deprivation and the resulting excess energy uh, from that. And estrogen deprivation can be menopause, it can be OVEX if you're a mouse, or it can be endocrine therapy, which is another part of my work that I'm not going to talk about. And essentially, we hypothesized that when the cells get big enough, FGF1 is produced in for the purpose of, of expanding these progenitors. And this is a normal process that keeps the adipose tissue healthy. But this is a problem when you have a tumor in this environment, especially one that may overexpress FGFR1, because that growth factor can just support the growth of the tumor. And so this is what, uh, this is the other part of my R01 that we're focused on. So our hypothesis was that FGF1 allows the tumors to maintain dependence on the estrogen receptor um, even when estrogen's not there because that's based, that's kind of what we were observing um, in vivo. So the concept of FGFR ER crosstalk is not new. I'm not the first one that, that came up with that. Um, it's so FGFR and ER crosstalk is already associated with endocrine resistance. It just hadn't been associated with obesity. Um, and there's a couple of different papers. One of them, one or two of them suggest that perhaps this crosstalk may involve direct interaction between FGFR and ER or between a portion of FGFR that's cleaved and can interact with ER. So FGFR is a cell surface receptor. ER is a, is a nuclear receptor transcription factor. Um, but what we've shown is that ER positive tumors that overexpress FGFR1 some, in some cases progress after you lose estrogen in obese mice. And um, we also showed in our 2018 paper that FGFR1 phosphorylation associates both with endocrine resistance and with obesity. So this is what we're really um, kind of exploring in, our, in the lab during our first year for, in real life, um, our first real lab year. So one of the things that we looked at was, so ER is, is a steroid receptor, a nuclear hormone receptor, and it's activated by phosphorylation. And this one of the sites that it can be phosphorylated on is serine 118. This is by far not the only site, um, but there is a database that's available that you can actually look at proteomics and how those predict patient outcome. And interestingly, we found that elevated phospho ER, serine 118, predicts almost significantly a shorter overall survival for patients with ER positive tumors and also with ER negative tumors, which is really interesting because ER negative tumors aren't supposed to have ER. But one of the things that happens when estrogen receptor is phosphorylated and activated is it's downregulated. And so there are some people who think that um, you know, tumors with really low expression of ER may, it, it's possible that they have activated ER. And this uh, kind of concept has been established also for the progesterone receptor. So this is consistent with our hypothesis, although unfortunately this data set doesn't have BMI associated with it. So we can't say anything about obesity, but we can say that activated estrogen receptor is not necessarily a good thing for patient survival. So the questions that we're asking right now are, um, does FGF1 activate the estrogen receptor? Is this something that depends on whether the, the model is endocrine resistant or endocrine sensitive? If it's normally a model that responds to estrogen deprivation the way it should, um, does that mean it doesn't respond to FGF? Uh, and also we're asking, is this something that depends on FGFR overexpression or is that just something we stumbled on that happens to be unrelated? And importantly, what is the outcome of FGF1 mediated ER activation? And I'll get to that towards the end. I, we don't have any real good data on it yet, but we're asking. And one of those things that we're asking is the gene expression signature, for example, from FGF1 dependent ER activation different from that of estrogen. And that has some translational implications. So one of the experiments we did was we, um, we did a proliferation assay in the presence of 
FGF1 or ICI. So ICI is ICI182780 or Fulvestrant. And this is a pure estrogen receptor down regulator. And we found this is in um, UCD12 cells. So we from, from some of our PDXs from Colorado, we actually have matched uh, 2D, 2D like dissociated cells. So it's a really nice model system where we have the tumor piece itself that we can grow in vivo, but we also have a cell line that we can do in vitro experiments with. And this is from one of those. So FTF1 increases proliferation in these cells and the proliferation can be blocked by blocking the estrogen receptor. And this is in the absence of phenol red, in the absence of serum with its fully stripped serum um, and no exogenous estrogen. And we've also shown in cell lines, so the, the PT is the cell line designation for these PDX tumors, UCD is the, actually the tumor designation. So PT12 and PT65, and we've done both of these studies in vivo with the tumor chunks, um, that estrogen, or sorry, that FGF1 increases uh, activation or phosphorylation of the estrogen receptor um, in both cases and um, so does estrogen, basically. So essentially, FGF1 does the same thing to these cell lines that estrogen does, which is really interesting. So then we, when we got, so this was all done in Colorado. Then we got to Oklahoma, <coughs> excuse me, and we got a hold of some tamoxifen-resistant MCF7 cells. So if you remember that I told you a few slides ago, the original sort of parental MCF cell line did not continue to grow in the presence of obesity. So it just sort of stayed the same some tumors shrunk, some tumors maybe grew a little bit, but overall there was not an obesity effect. And I don't, I can't tell you anything yet about whether the tamoxifen resistant cells grow in obesity, but I can tell you that when they become tamoxifen resistant, we see an increase in um, FGF1 mediated phospho ER, which is suggestive that it may activate the receptor. Now to get to the question about whether um, FGFR1 overexpression is important, I we did a, we tried to show that here and I'm maybe FGFR1 is a little bit higher in the tamoxifen resistant cells compared to the parentals, but I'm still not totally convinced by this Western blot. So basically I'm just reminding you here, MCF7 parentals didn't progress after estrogen withdrawal in the obese, but these cells may not overexpress FGFR1 or maybe they will, or maybe they do actually. Um, but it seems like FGF1 may increase the phosphorylation of estrogen receptor. So this is something we're following up right now. So the next thing that we started doing is experimentally overexpressing FGFR1 in those parental cells, because the difference between the parental MCF7s and the tamoxifen resistant extends far beyond whether they overexpress FGFR1. And we really had the question of whether FGFR1 overexpression was sufficient to confer FGF1 response um, in terms of estrogen receptor phosphorylation. And the answer is it's not. When we overexpress FGFR1, there are some things that different things that happen. The cells grow faster, they look different, but um, but basically uh, they do not respond to FGF1 stimulated ER activation. And you can see here the really nice FGFR1 overexpression. So this told us that something, this is telling us now that something besides FGFR1 overexpression um, may confer ER activation after FGF1 treatment. So then another question that we have is, is the gene expression signature of ER activation different depending on um, FGFR1 activation? And uh, in our one of our tumor studies, so this is the UCD12 tumor that we did in the lean and obese mice that we published in the JCI Insight paper. We did RNA sequencing on like four tumors per group. And we what we observed was that there were consistencies in the gene expression from the estrogen and E withdrawal treated high fat mice. The estrogen withdrawal effect seemed to be greater in the low fat mice, but we wondered if perhaps this, this gene expression profile that emerged after estrogen withdrawal or endocrine therapy in the obese was established even before the therapy occurred, which would be important and potentially, you know, is something that we're thinking could represent um, a diagnostic opportunity. You know, if there's a signature that's established early before the therapy takes place, then we may be able to predict, you know, patients that would or would not respond to therapy. So that's something that we're interested in. 
When we look at the pathways in these tumors, uh, comparing the tumors from obese versus lean, thing, I mean, these are you know just kind of generally confirming what we already suspect. The pathways that are classified as active include those associated with metastasis, malignancy, invasion, and migration. Death pathways are classified as being inactive in the obese tumors. And then the upstream regulators, as I showed you before, from some of the human data, um, include growth factor signaling pathways, including FGFR1, that not surprisingly is predicted to be active, which is we've we sort of validated. Um, and then FOXA1, MIC, FAS were things that were presumed to be inactive. So if we looked at the tumors, um, in the presence of estrogen to ask what genes were expressed. We looked at specifically at classical ER target genes, PR, uh, TFF1, which encodes PS2, GREB1. These are some classical ER targets. And we found that those were higher in the context of obesity in these tumors. Um, but this is not because the animals had elevated levels of estrogen. So the, the dashed line right here is kind of the lower limit of detection for our kit that we used. But basically there was not an obesity effect on serum estrogen, whether or not these animals have ovaries, whether or not they're supplemented with estrogen and after E withdraw. So if, if we're seeing evidence of ER activation, it is unlikely to be because of simply the ligand itself. So what we're doing right now is we're sequencing the cells to identify um, the signature that's specific to FGF1 mediated ER activation and estrogen dependent ER activation to see if we can come up with kind of a predictive way to assign people to, I guess, a more high risk group, like if we, you know, get into human tumors. So what we know so far is, um, so FGF1 is something that may link this concept of weight gain as a risk factor and ER positive breast cancer progression. Um, I've told you that the PDX cell lines that overexpress FGFR1, which includes the PT12 and PT65 cells from Colorado, show uh, ER phosphorylation when you treat with FGF1 in the absence of estrogen. But established cell lines such as MCF7 don't show this unless they're endocrine resistant. So what we're doing right now is we're going to go back and put those endocrine resistant lines in the animal model and ask, you know, do that, do they in fact progress after estrogen withdrawal? Um, but importantly, endocrine resistance doesn't necessarily correspond to FGFR1 overexpression. So while FGFR1 overexpression is associated with endocrine therapy resistance, it may not be sufficient to facilitate that effect. Um, and so simply overexpressing FGFR1 does not lead to FGF1 mediated ER phosphorylation. So the correlation between these things or among these things does not equal causation. So there's something else that allows the estrogen receptor to be activated by FGF1, either in addition to or besides FGFR1 overexpression. And what we're doing right now is we have some colleagues in Montreal who are doing proteomics analysis, phosphoproteomics analysis. They have some very fancy way of doing like a thousand different phosphocytes. And we're, we're exploring multiple ER phosphorylation sites. There have been several that have been associated with ER activation in different domains. Um, and of course, FGFR1 phosphorylation and a bunch of other things to really try to figure out what is it that uh, is responsible for this difference or for this um, phenotype that we're seeing. So translational implications are, you know, when I, in my, as I establish my lab, it's important to me personally to um, make sure that I'm kind of keeping an eye on the clinical relevance of the research. And in fact, one of the projects in the lab, the, what, the project that we're looking at focusing on the relationship between breast cancer therapy and diabetes was something that it was suggested to me actually by a friend of mine who is a breast cancer survivor and a, now a patient again. Um, and so, you know, and especially if you're funded by foundations, a lot of them like to have you know, a, an advocate involved in your research and kind of keep you focused on the patient goal. So basically one of the things that's known is that a lot of these, a lot of drugs, including FGFR inhibitors haven't been very successful in clinical trials. Um, and it's possible that this is because the assignment to those clinical trials is, has been historically based on just genomic alteration of FGFR1. So they look for people that 
have amplification of the receptor in their tumors. And this is sort of a something that I have realized over the last few years as I'm establishing my lab is that the tumor is what dictates a lot of things. It dictates the treatment choice, the clinical trial assignment, and that's important. And then we've done a lot of good work using that, but I think there's something to be said for the whole body environment in which the tumor is growing. So for example, the BMI of the patient, the metabolic phenotype is not considered. There's a lot of gray area. We have BMI as a, um, is a black and white way, is a you know very clear way of defining patients by their BMI, but metabolic phenotype isn't. Um, although some of my colleagues who work in diabetes are working on a definition of metabolic dysfunction that's based on fasting insulin, which is really interesting, and I'm hoping to incorporate some of that into the studies. Um, but our goal is really to identify um, biomarkers in cancer of estrogen-independent ER activation. Um, and because estrogen uh, withdrawal therapy is a treatment for breast cancer, and if you are withdrawing estrogen and your receptor is still active, then that, from like a growth factor or something, then that has a big clinical implications. And I'm hopefully, you know, over my career, going to provide some kind of rationale and even criteria for incorporating the concept of, of the whole body metabolism um, into clinical studies to basically prevent breast cancer recurrence and maybe prevent it overall. So <laughs> here's uh, the picture of, of Brad that, you know, from, from Rhode Island, you know, a classic Brad photo. Um, we've known each other for a long time and go way back in the mammary biology field. And I want to specifically thank, gosh, that was really fast. I want to specifically thank, um, you know, all of my mentors and colleagues from Colorado. Uh, but really, I want to point out Stevie, who we were talking about earlier, and Marisol, who joined me from Colorado. These ladies took a chance, moved with me to a new institution during a pandemic and have absolutely worked themselves to death to set up the lab and get all of our studies off the ground. And I'm happy to answer any questions or, you know, chat more about this work. All right. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I see uh, Dr. Ogbas has his hand up virtually. Okay. So I'll start um, with him. I, let me put you guys back on gallery so I can see everybody. Oh, hang on. I couldn't see. Okay. All right. I can see you. Hello. Do you hear me? Hi. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilberg, So uh, sharing with us your, your science. It's really nice. I have a quick question. Uh, you have said that uh, during the menopause, so not much uh, estrogens are available, but the E are, are active. Estrogen receptors are active. So some of the stuff can be specifically or non specifically binds and uh, uh, the uh, triggers the signal transduction. I was just thinking that uh, is there anybody or you were thinking about the using the ER antagonist ligand to silence the ER activity so that, the, yeah, there is no ER uh, available because of the, I mean, the estrogens are available because of the. Um, uh, menopause, but the ERs are active. Let's just uh, silence them with the antagonists. It will bind and silence, but not signal transduction will be signal transduction will be transmitted. What do you think? Yeah, I, I actually completely agree with you. Um, and those studies I proposed in my R01 to do in rodents. And right now, you know, the approved the approved ER pure antagonists are pretty rough, you know, like fulvestrant is clinically prescribed for, for um, late stage breast cancer, but it's a difficult drug for women to take. And so to get to your concept, I absolutely agree. I think that we need to provide some rationale for targeting the receptor rather than the hormone itself because I think that the receptor could be, you know, still active, even when the hormone's not there, like you said. Um, and so what using existing treatments that are currently approved, I think is probably a long shot. I think it would be hard to convince a woman or even a doctor to prescribe the really hardcore estrogen receptor down regulators. 
but there are a lot of companies that are developing new ones. And so that's what I'm interested in is these new, you know, whether they're called CIRMs or CIRDs, you know, whether they're modulators or down regulators, I'm curious about whether they could be a little bit less aggressive and more useful. The other thing, the only reason I think that we would run into trouble with that line of thinking is because estrogen receptor is, a, is generally a good thing everywhere except the breast tumor. And so when you really aggressively target the estrogen receptor and, and eliminate all of its function, you do end up with some pretty severe metabolic problems. Probably, probably a partial antagonist might be, might be an option. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that would be perfect. And I think, so the, so the <laughs> I know. You need, you need to team up with the, uh, what is the medicinal chemist. So they, yeah, they I know. <laughs> billions of the chemicals. So now you have to have an army of the people to screen them. Which yeah, is. well, and you put people, but you know, we have a good model because we can screen the metabolic effects yeah, and we can yeah. also screen the cancer yeah. effects. Yeah, so no, I totally well, agree with you. Students, undergraduate students will love it. You know, they will, uh, <laughs> yeah, they will, we will have to, screen, we do know? have to be careful if like, I totally agree. We want to just, destroy that receptor in the breast tumor, but we have to be careful because yeah. women yeah. don't want to lose it in their adipose or their muscle, yeah. you know, that matter in the bone too, right? So yeah, this, the modulator, the selective modulator is the way to go. We just want, we just need to have the perfect one that does, that's like the, well, equal, good luck. yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right, I also see Dr. Wolf with his hand raised. Yeah, I, I enjoyed your talk um, very much. The um, question, I mean, you kept using the word progression, and I was going to ask you what you meant by that, because uh, the tumors could get bigger or they could multiply. And and so I was really pleased when you, you, you showed that model there of how you actually ended up with some hyperplasia. And the, the question that I have for you, though, is why would they leave? I mean, I what what would cause the if they're happy where they're at, what what do you think is causing these cancers to leave? They they don't really bother me when I can get in there and cut them out. Yeah. Um, so and you know MCF seven doesn't metastasize normally. Uh, it does. So that so great great questions and thank you for asking that. So progression the way that I think that I define it for most of my work is grow the grow continued growth of a primary tumor after you've assigned some kind of a treatment. Um, metastasis is the clinical, for sure, the clinical definition of progression, um, but that's difficult to study in mice until we actually have done some pilot studies in this obesity model where we put the cells, cells orthotopically and they do metastasize. And I don't have any slides on that, but I could email you data if you're interested. They'll metastasize from the orthotopic site in the obese mice. But that's the not- The MCF7? I mean, I, really, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, we haven't published it, but we have. Uh, so we did a study where we labeled the cells, GFP labeled MCF7. They'll metastasize for sure to the local lymph nodes, but the obese, so the lean animals had no distant organ metastases, which is what everybody would expect um, using the label to track them. But the obese females, we had lung mets and we had one animal with a brain met. It was Phenomenal. And so that's that's a different project that some of my colleagues in Colorado are still working on. Um, but so to answer your question, um, progression in, in the talk that I gave you right now is just simply talking about the continued growth of a primary tumor that remains in C2 after treatment. And I, and I realized that in humans, they take the primary tumor out. And so it, you're not looking at the continued growth of a primary tumor in humans. It's really metastatic progression that we're focused on. But to answer your question about what makes them wanna leave, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that they want to leave so much as they just acquire the ability to leave. And so they leave. You know, if you think about sort of the hallmarks, the classical hallmarks of cancer and like the ability to invade and metastasize and alter the microenvironment, and then the whole genomic instability, I think they leave because they just, they can. You know, I don't think that they necessarily want to, but I, but I really don't know how FGF and estrogen withdrawal in this model system contributes mechanistically to invasion and metastasis. Uh, some of the stuff we put in the paper in 2018, we did show changes in the microenvironment, like collagens and MMPs changed in the tumors. 
um, with obesity. So it's suggestive of sort of a pre-metastatic uh, niche that's developing. And this was in the PDX, the UCD12 PDX. But yeah, I um, I know, I realized that primary breast tumors are not what, what are lethal for people. It's the metastases that are. So that's really where we need to be going with a lot of this work. Have you ever heard of RGS4? No. Okay. Well, the reason I mention this is I, I worked with my colleague Yaping too at Creighton University before I came here. Uh -huh. And what was fascinating to me was that we found that RGS4 levels didn't correspond with uh, the high expression didn't correspond with protein levels. And ultimately what we realized was it was because there was a cysteine um, that functioned as an oxygen sensor. And, and so when RGS4 levels are low, then the cancer cells run off oh, and, okay. and they metastasize. So my longstanding hypothesis in this area is that when the cells are in a state where there is hypoxia, um, they're, they're looking to move. They, want, they, they are looking for something. They're looking to yeah. move. They, mm -hmm. they need nutrients. And so in my mind's eye, uh, you, you brought new, you, you know, you arguably brought nutrients in there, but you're also bringing white cells into the tissue mm -hmm. when, you, when you vascularize it, that could kill them. And thank you yes. very much for the nutrients, but I'm just backing my ass up here. And eventually yeah. I back it I'm into the, <laughs> uh, it, well, eventually I back it into the lymphatics and yeah. well, now I'm carried away. So now I have to find a new home. And so that's mm -hmm. been an idea that I've had for years that I, I personally have never been able to follow up on. That's really so I enjoyed your talk yeah. very much. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, and I have a lot of data sets. So if you ever want to just email me and I can look for different genes, but you know, that's, so the other thing that I, that regarding metastasis that we haven't studied, but that I think other people are hypothesizing, including me, is that obesity and this metabolic dysfunction alters the metastatic niche as well, right? So like a liver in a person with obesity is different than a liver with who doesn't have obesity. And so there might be some pull from the peripheral organs too, you know, to facilitate metastatic implantation, like metastatic outgrowth. And I don't know anything about that. I, that's yeah, not what I said. We're big on G protein coupled receptors. So another thing yeah. that we, we did research on was um, um, PXR1. Okay. No, uh, on PREX1, not PXR1. Okay, just like, I don't know that one but, either. Yeah, well, so so that was kind of like eyes. And so in, in one population of cancer cells, all we did was transfect it. And we had cells that metastasized when normally they stayed home. And so the idea in my wow. mind's eye was that that happens to function as a combination of a GPR uh, modulator and a uh, a, a guest growth factor modulator, yeah. but the idea that when you had uh, a coincidence detector that it would direct you, you know, a, a cell just going around in circles never gets anywhere, but when it's got some place to go, it can actually get there. So yeah. I'll, I'll, sh I'll shut up now. I've, I know I've talked too much. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate the discussion. That's all interesting stuff that I hadn't even thought about any of it like that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Dr. Stottinger. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Welberg, uh, Dr. Uh, Welberg, for coming and giving your your excellent talk. Thank you. Thanks. I'm a, I'm a nuclear receptor guy myself. Awesome. And uh, <laughs> pregnant the X receptor was my meat and potatoes for many years. Okay. Um, and it's also a phosphoprotein nuclear receptor. Mm -hmm. uh, moreover, we were interested in how phosphorylation could impact sumylation, could impact uh -huh. ubiquitylation, could impact actually acetylation. These things don't operate in a vacuum and, and they yeah. do interface with each other. And in the case of pregnant X receptor, there was a clear interface. So I wondered if you'd looked at simulation or acetylation in particular. We haven't looked at any of it. And you know what? I it honestly, embarrassingly um, did not even occur to me, but you're absolutely right. And you know who comes to mind is um, Carol Lang, who's a progesterone receptor researcher. Uh, she's looked at all the, how, you know, progesterone receptor phosphorylation and simulation for sure, assimilation um, influence its activity. And so that's a great uh, question. I haven't, I haven't looked at it. Um, you know, I'm trying to think, would we be able to do that with our, pro how would you, how did you look at it? Did you do proteomics? Yes. So what we did yeah. force okay. over express the receptor with a tag, pull it out of cells or animals, 
uh, mm -hmm. transgenic animals and look at the acetylation or simulation okay. status using yeah. proteomics approach. Yeah, I should do some. That's a great question. Good question. We I I haven't looked, but I should. Thanks. I have a question for you, Dr. Welberg. Uh, first of all, I have a statement. Thank you for choosing the picture you did. I was a bit concerned when you said you had some. Um, they didn't come from the uh, cocktail hour, um, but rather just a walk. No, um, no, I uh, I did re I did review the cocktail hour pictures, and I thought no, <laughs> 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 not a not a good idea. But I do love I do love your uh, gesturing towards the beautiful harbor um, yes. before we ate lobster. Yeah. So my question, um, it, it's a I don't know I don't I wouldn't say it's complex, but it's more <clears throat> focused on the uh, the the human the humanistic side of things in terms mm -hmm. of um, obesity and weight gain and its, its role in cancer. And, and it's great that you're developing these mouse models because they're needed. But I wonder um, if you've looked into or read anything uh, or, or given thought about, um, you know, individuals who are obese or overweight often go through multiple fluctuations. Yeah. Weight gain and weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, and if that if the initiation of FGF receptors and its its interaction with ER uh, is triggered by obesity, first of all, does that go away, um, or does that persist even if an individual loses weight? Um, and second of all, does that influence the tumors that could eventually be caused by uh, or or influenced by obesity? What are your thoughts on that? Um, though, so those are great questions. The you're absolutely right. The weight cycling is a very common. In fact, it's probably there are probably very few people that be, that acquire obesity and then lose weight forever. Right? They just you know it's a common thing to gain regain lost weight. And the biological drive to regain lost weight is incredibly strong. And there's a whole field of people that study what is it about that. Um, what I know about, at least for the adipose tissue, is that there is some evidence that in some animals, so let's say you have 100 animals and they all you put them all up to obesity and then they all lose weight. In like 30 to 50% of those animals, there will be this like, memory in the adipose tissue. And it's really strongly characterized by inflammation, by immune cell infiltration. And so, um, and I don't know, that's not really my area. So I don't know really about that. But what it tells me is that within the, even as there is a spread of metabolic function within, within the category of obesity, there's probably a spread of inflammation and a spread of persistence that is that we don't know enough about and how to pick out who will have that obesogenic memory and who won't. So there is the possibility that for some people it is somewhat some of those effects are lasting. As far as FGF being one of those lasting effects, I don't know for sure. Um, it seems the data that we have right now suggests that FGF is really strongly associated with very large hypertrophic adipocytes. So if you um, reduce the size of your adipocytes, theoretically, you shouldn't receive that signal from in your body that would need to make FGF to expand your progenitor. So I would be optimistic and think that the FGF signal specifically is something that could be reversed with weight loss. But I don't know that for sure, because I don't know how the mature adipocyte is permanently impacted by weight gain and, and what aspects of it are impacted. I do know some immune cells are, but as far as the adipocytes, I'm not sure. Um, but we have, we can do this um, weight gain and weight loss and regain type of stuff in this mouse model. And it would be interesting to do a tumor study and put in tumors um, I, in fact, Steve Hursting is, is a colleague of mine at UNC Chapel Hill, and I think he's done that, where he's done weight loss studies in mice and put in syngeneic mammary cancer lines. And I do think that there is some evidence that the environment remains tumor promotional even after weight loss. So that's discouraging for people. 
Um, but again, this is a mouse study. I, I don't know about in humans. And it really does suggest that perhaps a lot of our efforts need to be put into preventing weight gain, you know, for sure, like if we can prevent it. And, and so one of the things that we're looking at in this mouse model is really like, is weight gain during menopause, that three to four week period where we've zeroed in in the animals, is that something that's really, really critical and can we block it? And so, um, you know, we, we have done a study where we've shown if you just prevent that weight gain by, so you don't make the animals lose weight. You just, when they hit menopause, you restrict their calories and they just stay flat with their body weight. That is sufficient to produce, to prevent mammary tumor progression in that rat model that I talked about at the beginning. We're writing that paper now. I need to just get it out, but, um, so yeah, it's complicated. And, you know, I think that what I think is really missing from the cancer field is the concept that the person's metabolic environment is a huge factor that needs to be considered for treatment. Oh, I guarantee, uh, I, I completely agree. And not just metabolic, but their entire endocrine environment. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, yes everything. I mean, yeah, there's a lot going on. So we're doing, we've done great. Biology has done really well, but you know, it's time to acknowledge some of these comprehensive complex diseases, I think.